Hi everybody, I am here with Spencer Reeve here at the Cool Mini or Not Expo here in the already hot and humid Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. He yeah, couldn't. these shirts. Hey, I'm wearing these shirts, man. They're not doing me any favors right now. Trust me. So this is a three-day expo uh, that uh, the company runs in Atlanta. And this is, how many years have you done this? This will be our second, actually. This is just our second expo. Wow. Yep. OK, because I remember it last year. I didn't get a chance to come. Well, let me tell you what, for just your second year, this is an incredible job. There are, I'll take some, you, I'll show you some shots of it, but there are beautiful banners all over the place. A lot of people are engaged in games, a lot of demos going going on but we want to talk about some of the games that that's come out in the past some ones that are coming that is just released and stuff maybe that's coming out in the future but first as from the movie uh, office space what exactly is it you do here <laughs> right so for cool mini I'm a marketing executive which basically means I deal with a lot of the ways that the community and the public deal with our company and how we deal with them. So things like uh, marketing messages, uh, video production, like I overlook video production, I don't do them, I write some of the scripts, but I don't do any of the actual production itself. Right. But I, I'm looking at the final products and I'm saying yes or no, or coming up with concepts like gameplay videos or trailers. We do a lot of Kickstarters at Cool Mini, so I write a, a fair amount of the Kickstarter trailers. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I write the, the trailer scripts. And then uh, I help organize this. It, it's a team effort, but it's, you know, a lot of it is final say for me and uh, a close uh, partner of mine. And then uh, I also do all sorts of other day-to-day -day activities that are minutia that nobody would find particularly interesting. So that is basically to say, one thing I will say about Cool Mini is that we make a lot of games and we do fairly well on Kickstarter. So we have the, people perceive us as this huge company, but we're really only a team of about 16 people. Wow. So all of us wear a lot of hats and do a lot of jobs and we work really hard to make it look like we're so big when we're actually very small. Well, let's see. Let's go back a little bit of history. How long has the company been around? So the company's been around since 2001, but it started as a website. So the website was basically a uh, hotornot.com parody for miniatures. So right. hotornot.com was you take a picture of yourself, a selfie before there were yes. selfies. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and you post it up and people rated you. Well, this was like, okay. What, what rating did you get? I always got fours, <laughs> which not so bad. Not so good, but not so bad. It's not bad. And, uh, but on Cool Mini, they were basically like, this is that for people who like to paint. And uh, my paintings get way worse than my pictures. So, <laughs> but basically we did that, and it's a very community-focused website. It was something that we were uh, very interested in keeping as we move forward as a company. The idea of like, one, we're doing this for a community who likes miniatures, who likes to paint miniatures, and who likes games because mm -hmm. usually miniatures and games go hand in hand, right? Right. So as we moved forward, we became a retail company that sold supplies while also making a small line of boutique kind of specialty miniatures, our own miniatures that were just kind of, you know, boutique, low, low print runs, small numbers, exclusive miniatures through our retail store. Right. Um, that gave us the capital to start publishing games. Mm -hmm. Our first published game uh, was Super Dungeon Explorer, and then we went into Kickstart Zombicide. And Zombicide was a huge success on Kickstarter. It kind of gave us a new business model, but it also put us out in the public mindset. And people saw us not only from the game, the game, the quality of the game, but also saw us for the amount of money we were making on Kickstarter and the amount of attention we were gathering in that in that area. And that kind of rolled into this and it hasn't stopped. I mean, we, we continue to do very well on Kickstarter. We continue to make new, more fans. We have our second year of the Expo. We have huge spaces at Gen Con. And so basically the company's just growing exponentially and you know, not only from just the number of people we're employing, because we've doubled three years ago, this was a three and a half, maybe four years ago, this was a two-person company. Wow. Two years ago, this was a uh, you know, a, a six-person company. When I started the company about a year ago, I actually started shortly after Expo last year. Okay. I got my job because of Expo last year. Nice. I came here and I did some interviews uh, as a volunteer. Right. And they, they liked the fact that I could look at the camera and smile. And... Uh, <laughs> And they and they, they they said they thought they had a position for me. So, but you know, since I've been on the team, the company's grown another four or five people over the last year. So, right. it, it's been it's been crazy and it's it's awesome, right? Because we have people here like Rodney Smith is here this weekend and Tom Vassell is here this weekend. And what's what's amazing with having those guys here is that that's 
a, a very big moment of legitimacy, right. right? Of saying these guys are coming to our show and are interested in being here. We're not right. begging them to come. They, we offered them, to, we invited them. And they said, sure, of course. Like you make great games. We want to see what you got coming up. And so, and then as that, as this being our own show, this is where we like to do a lot of big reveals, right? Yeah. So yeah. So before we get to that, yeah. so what about your a miniature line Dark Age? Was that, where did that come into play? So Dark Age existed before uh, Cool Mini or not. Uh, it existed at the game system before Cool Mini or not went into publishing. Okay. Cool Mini or not basically, re it was the rights to publish the game was held by David Dowster, our director, mm -hmm. and then basically when he when we became Cool Mini or not, the publishing company, we rolled those rights into Cool Mini. So basically, that game was around before us right. as a publisher, but we just basically adopted the IP because it was owned by the director of Cool Mini, mm -hmm. and so. Technically, it is a game we publish, but we—it's not something we own. It's similar to like a—it's similar to a partner product. Okay. So. All right. So now let's jump forward to the the big game that which basically made this company just blow up. Yeah. Zombie side. Yeah. Uh, that was the first uh, a Kickstarter. Yep. And at the time, it was still now zombies are still a big deal. Yes, they are. And uh, you, you guys, sorry, <laughs> your company basically. Was one of the first to come out the really big, broad zombie game. Yeah, yeah. You, you kind of started something there. It was like, okay, another zombie game, but you guys kind of started, in my opinion. Yeah. But, um, so that was what two years ago. Yes. That the Kickstarter happened. Uh -huh. um, I remember it, it came out. You couldn't be found anywhere. Yep. Uh, very hard to find. Uh, it is a fantastic co-op game. It's very tense. And obviously, you're riding out the success of that. Yep. You came out with the second version of it. Yep. And then you're starting to come out with the expansions. Mm -hmm. So give us a little bit on Zombie Side and where you are, maybe where you're going to be going forward. Sure. So uh, we've already mentioned it on the site now. One, of, like I said, we like to talk about it, reveals here. We're going to be revealing Zombie Side season three here, which we've been talking about before. People know some of the concepts that are out there, but we're going to have an in-depth panel very shortly. Actually, sometime today, there's going to be a in-depth panel that's going to have uh, things that people don't know about the game yet that are going to get mentioned, uh, locations, mm -hmm. uh, things that I know that I'm not allowed to say, so I'm trying to kind of dance around what I know is coming. But I should have talked to you after it. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, there's you, maybe, but you should definitely be a part of that panel because okay. if you're interested in Zombicide, there's some really cool stuff that they're going to be talking about. And uh, we also have all the stuff that we released last year, which, like you said, the expansions, the zombie dogs, the dog companions, uh, Toxic City Mall, Prison Outbreak, and then the, the expansion zombie sets and the guest artist boxes and stuff like that. So one thing, like for example, people always ask us was, how can I get my hand on those promo characters you guys do on the right. Kickstarter without having to pay the eBay prices for them? And so we listened to that and we said, look, what we should do is we should make additional survivors. That's what people want. And so we went to three really big game artists, guys who make awesome art for games like Magic and, and even D&D &D and stuff like that. And we were like, we'll have them design their own survivors right. and make those go retail. So for 25 bucks, you can get a survivor pack that has two survivors in it and then they're two Zombiver versions. So you're getting four miniatures out of it, but you're getting those for $25, which is way better than paying some sort of incredibly high eBay price for a limited edition survivor. Now, if it's a, you want it because it's a limited edition thing, I can't help you there. Right. But if you just want more survivors, that's a, a great alternative for, that we feel like we've produced in that case, right? So. Basically, with Zombicide, things are going very well. Things are—I mean, we're we're selling out still, and we've got season three right around the corner, and we're going to be releasing some news here in hours, right? Nice, yeah. nice. And um, Kickstarter for season three? Yeah, sometime this summer, probably. Okay. Yep. All right, and yep. then probably release sometime next year. Late this year, probably early next year. Okay. Where that is, where that lies in production is a a symbiotic relationship between ourselves. Guillotine Games, the guys that design it, and kind of help figure out the production analysis, and then China, right? right? So it's a group effort, and so getting that exact release date, this is why when we do our Kickstarters, right, we always point out everything's an estimate, because anything can happen, right? So right. right now, estimated release date would probably be into this year, early next year, yeah. Now, another game I got to check out uh, last year at Origins, mm -hmm. Chaos Ball. Yes. Saw it in the boxes over there. Yep. I see Eric Lang back over here oh, in yeah. the corner. Tell us a little about Chaos Ball. So Chaos Ball is Eric Lang's new game from us. It's going to retail very soon. The Kickstarter is shipped completely in America. Uh, Asia Pacific is shipping, I believe, this week and next week. And then I think at the end of this month, so next week, 
it should be begin shipping in uh, EU for our EU backers, and that'll take a little bit of time. So everyone should have it by the beginning of next month. Um, unless you come here. Unless you come here. Because it's right over there. Which I is saw right, it. yes. <laughs> we have the game here, and one of the other things we have is uh, we, because we are the, the, the publisher, we already have all the expansion teams. Right. This is the first place, if you did not do the Kickstarter, this is the first place you can purchase the expansion teams, right? right. Um, which we're very happy about because the game's super cool. It's this like brutal fantasy sports game that plays kind of like a first person shooter where you're dominating each other, killing each other, and holding down control points while also scoring with a ball, stealing, you know, and, and you know, playing almost like rugby. Right. So it's, it's a really great um, fast paced game, but what I really like about it is it's not dice based. There is a, a dice breaker, there is a tiebreaker dice. That is awesome for when you guys play the same cards, but it's all card based. And Eric Lang has a huge history of making awesome card games. So you've got that element of a miniature game on the table where you're beating each other up. You have strategic control points and you have strategies of moving models, but you also have the, the elements of kind of acclaimed Eric Lang games of card based. I have these cards, you have those cards and uh, burning cards and, and kind of doing cheat cards and all these other power cards. So it's got a lot of layers of depth to it when it comes to the actual cards element. And then the miniatures on board look fantastic and kind of give it fun, almost again, similar to Zombicide style, moving on the board, but very competitive. Another nice thing about it is it's four players at once, right? Yes. So when you do that, it's crazy. You know, everyone's fighting, everyone's beating each other up. It's complete chaos, but it's hilarious and it's surprising. And the nice thing about the game is having that kind of tone of being silly and, and, and brutal allows for you to see those, when you see those teams that are in the other room, you can see that how that tone carries into those teams as well, right? We have the Hellcats that are like these kind of feline anime type girls, and then we have, you know, uh, the pirates, and they all have their own special team abilities, right? So when mm -hmm. the pirates attack you, they actually steal your money. And you use money to buy team upgrades and to cheat. When you cheat, you can pay the bri you can uh, bribe the officials so that nobody, there's no penalties level leveled against you. So it's a very cool game. All right, so the Kickstarter backer is going to get it. Yeah. It's here. If you're here, you can pick it up. Yep. What about for those who did not back at Kickstarter who are not here, when can they get it? Uh, we'll probably have it at Origins and Gen Con, okay. and then it'll move into retail uh, probably within the next two to three weeks. So so retailers should have it probably within three three weeks to a month at the latest. So you'll be seeing it at your local game store soon. Uh, and then if you're going to go to Origins or Gen Con, we'll probably have we will for sure have the game and the expansion teams, right. which will be the, the the fastest way to get the expansion teams. Right. And there are a lot of expansions on that table. Yeah. Um, you can take a look at them here and see what they look like. It's just just tons of them. Yes. Different. And I guess. I mean, that's what's great about this. You can add either to your existing faction mm -hmm. or your existing teams with additional characters, additional cards, or come up with brand new teams. Right, so you can buy additional ringers that you can add into your team, or you can buy new teams. And one of the reasons we did this was the idea was that one person buys the box copy of the game, they get four teams. They play it with four friends. The friends love it. They're not ready to go to the full hundred dollars for the game, so they go and grab a $25 expansion team right. that they can carry themselves, right. right? And they can take to their friend's house and say, "Well, this these are my these are my ninjas. I'll play my ninjas and you can play, you know, one of your your teams from the box like the Amazons or something." Right. It, it gives it gives our customers an option that's a deviation from just buy the box. Yes. You and your friend just buy the box. That's a great option for some games, right? But in this case, because it's a sports game, because there's so many teams, we thought it was a good idea that one person buys the box and then his friends can buy expansion teams, right? No, that, that's, that's a fantastic idea. And it's, it's, a, it's a great idea, like you said, for people to get into it who maybe don't want to invest in the full game. Sure. And uh, it's like, here, go drop 25 bucks, buy your own team, paint them up and make them look nice and everything. So that's fantastic. So there's Zombie Side, there's Chaos Ball. Anything else current, or we're going to start talking about maybe some stuff in the future, some reveals. I would be, I would be destroyed by the fans if I did not mention that River Wars is here with Ted Terranova, and River Wars has been a very successful Kickstarter as well as it's doing very well in retail and at our conventions, and that is uh, basically this kind of War War One steampunky game that plays similar to a. Um, a real-time strategy game, but it is turn-based. Right. And it's, you know, you're putting a lot of models on the field and you're throwing them at each other, and Ted has a great eye for art, and he has a great eye for um, kind of design, 
And all of that comes in together in these beautiful little miniatures that are adorable while they're blowing each other up, destroying each other. So that game is super exciting. And again, it's similar to ours. The tiles are all modular, so you can have multiple different maps. You've got multiple uh, like different units that you can deploy, as well as the tanks are all upgradable. We have the expansions that are going to be coming to Kickstarter backers, as well as retail here, as uh, we have the basically the production proofs, so what the final versions are going to play, feel like and look like. We have one set of those here, so people can see what the planes are going to be like when we bring the planes in. The planes are super cool because they sit on these little clear stands and mm -hmm. fly over and bomb the guys below. So River Wars is uh, also here, and that Ted Terranova is here, and he's it's just awesome watching him sit down with the fans and play the game. Right. But with that said, yeah, it's time to probably move on to the the new stuff, right? Okay, uh, I'll let you I'll let you start with where we go with the new stuff first. Cause I know there's one in my mind because I'm looking at it over the corner of uh, your, over your shoulder over here, but yeah. So I'll start with uh, I'll start with we have our, our first print production. It's still a little rough, but it's a prototype of uh, Ron and Bones, which is something we just recently announced. It is our pirate game, and it plays like a MOBA, so League of Legends or Dota. Oh, wow. So you have minions that march at each other and kill each other off, and then each player on either side is on their own boat moving their heroes who have special abilities. That's cool. It's a super cool game. It's a little farther off, um, but you can see the prototype here. You can see how beautiful the art is. You can see how cool the miniatures are. Um, it is an existing line that we bought that we developed a game around. So people who are familiar with the Ron and Bones line will see uh, those awesome miniatures those guys made, which are kind of these Disney-esque looking, almost Pixar looking miniatures. Mm -hmm. with like big jaw proportions, bigger torsos very cutesy while also being very aesthetically appeasing mm -hmm. playing in a very cool MOBA style game where I'm out strategizing you and then it takes place on a boat and one of the things I love about that game is that it plays like a pirate movie and it has those water cooler moments for example we were playing the other night one of the guys needed to swing across the riggings to go from his boat to the other guy's boat to win the game. He just needed to get over there and do one action to blow this thing up and win the game. But you have to roll for a, rig a rigging check. He rolled and failed and fell in the water and lost the game. So his big epic move was him just falling into the water and the game ending because the next turn the guy just marched in and destroyed his ship. So wow. really cool game, recommend checking that out. But the game you're probably talking about, which is a huge departure for Hold on, hold on, before we go to that one yeah. is, I stink at MOBA games, I hope I'm better at this one. Oh. So I get yeah. dominated in League of so Legends and those thing, types of games. That's the nice thing about this game is, I'm the same way, uh, I'm not particularly good at this game either, but what's cool about this game is because you're not on the internet, it's a little more casual and it's not so rude, right? Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, well it depends on who you play with. Yeah, exactly, that's true, yeah. that's true. Okay, so, but I think there is one game, one announcement, that's kind of overshadowing all this other stuff. Everybody seems to be talking about it. There's a lot of buzz. Rodney and Tom were playing it earlier today. I sat in a panel about it. Tell us about it. Sure, so we've got uh, our upcoming game that does not use miniatures. It's a big departure for us, right? So it's an or not. It is an or not, exactly. <laughs> it's the or not. Um, although they're trying to change that, I think, at the last minute, but okay. for the most part, it's an or not. And it's, uh, it's Xenoshift, and it's a card-based game that we think is bringing something different to the deck builder genre. And the reason why we think that is because you have your standard deck builder tropes of, as, the game, as you play the game, you're getting more cards, you're getting uh, you know, better hands, but it is a fully cooperative game where four players are trying to defend their base from these kind of angry aliens as they're strip mining this planet. All right. And it's a lane game where you're basically doing tower defense like you would on a computer game. Oh, cool. Right, so what makes the game interesting is that not only is the, are the mechanics simple where you've, your cards are basically, this guy does attack, my marine does certain attack and damage, and the alien has a certain attack and damage and they kind of math out against each other, similar to something like Hearthstone, where he does six damage, he has five health, he's gonna kill him, right? He has three, he does three damage, and this guy receives three damage from it. So basically, it's very simple when you are resolving how the, the mechanically works across, which is good, because it means it only takes about five minutes for you to really figure out how the game plays, but there's layers of depth that we have inside of that, of buying upgrades, getting, um, 
special items like grenades and having other items like the medevac which allows you to save a guy's life and then move him over to another lane, right? Right. And so basically you can help a guy out, pick this guy up, and then move him over to your lane. So you've saved this character's life, but you've also put him in your lane. There's a lot of strategic elements for that, but um, it does allow for you to basically steal a dead character. And because when the characters die in your lane, they go back into your deck. So similar to a deck builder, I'm building my deck, you're building your deck, but we're working together to save our base from the aliens. So it's basically a deck building game with a tower defense mechanic and a sci-fi theme. Yes, yeah, exactly. Fantastic. And it's brutal, it's it's super hard. Uh, you know, the first couple of turns aren't terrible, but as you get to the second wave, you start realizing this is a hard game and I've really got to work together and I've really got to think about what I'm going to do. But the, the, the best part about it is, the alien cards, you only ever see the alien card that you're currently fighting. The other ones are face down, even though they've been dealt out. And although it's a kind of a simple mechanic, when you flip that card over and you see what's next, that reveal is a, a <laughs> moment for everybody playing, right? So that, it's that surprise, even though it's a simple mechanic, it really changes the, the flavor of the game, right? And so we have that game uh, pretty much finished mechanically, and so far the reviews from here are very, very positive. People have loved it. Right. Yeah. And in fact, the demo table has been busy the entire time that it's been going. I haven't had a chance to sit down. Now, some of your guests uh, for the uh, con, uh, Tom Vassell, yep. uh, Rodney Smith, mm -hmm. and even a local game designer, Steve Avery, yep. uh, sat in and played this morning. And I talked to the guys afterwards, and they lost. Yeah. And uh, they said it was brutal. Yeah. Uh, Rodney was telling me that he got to the first wave and was like, oh, this game is nothing. And then second wave, it's like, whoa. And then third wave, it's like, yeah. everything just kind of blew up. And there's a clever design there because you want to teach people how to play the game in the first wave. You want to t show them it's going to get hard in the second wave. And everything that they've been doing, should be they should be investing wisely, buying resources, buying technology, collecting resources and buying technology that's going to help them for that final wave. It's a nice ramp. It's a smooth ramp that indicates to players like, this is uh, going to get hard. This is how the game plays. And one of the nice things about it is when you lose, when you flip that one, that one nasty alien over that destroys your lane and does a ton of damage to your base, you go, had that been a different alien or had I had a grenade, we would have been all right. Right. And that gets you to stand up after the game ends, look at the board and go, okay, and sit right back down. You know, because right. it's that moment of going, the, the chance of what I drew, and if I had invested a little bit more wisely, get you to jump right back in. Right. And we usually play two to three games back to back in the office. Wow. And yeah. how long does the game take? Uh, between 30 to 60 minutes, because uh, if you play well, I think about an hour, depending, again, that depends on the player count. Right. If you play poorly, you're going to die pretty fast. Speaking of player count, how many people can it play? It plays uh, one to four. It is fully it is fully cooperative, so that means you can't play single player. The way the game works is every person adds 15 life to the base. So if you play single player, you have 15 life. It's a good way to learn the rules and kind of experiment, but you probably won't make it through the full three waves. Two players to four players is a little more manageable. Right. So I talked to uh, some of the guys that demoed, and I asked them, I said, what's the difference between, say, zombie side, mm. which is a swarm of zombies trying to take out the party, and this game, which is a swarm of aliens trying to take yeah. out the party? Because I thought, when I first heard, I thought maybe it sounds the same, and they were saying, no, it's totally different. Uh, they said the theme's totally different. You got a, a bunch of uh, scraggly survivors trying to survive a zombie yeah. apocalypse, and over here you've got like military men with yeah. all their equipment that are trying to uh, fight against the defense. Plus, they said the mechanics are totally different. One's a deck building game, and the other is kind of a move and roll type game. The the thing about that the game that's very clever is that you start with a militia card. And the militia cards are basically untrained workers who have picked up a gun to fight off the aliens because it's a mining company on a, on, a, on another planet, on an alien right. planet. So your militia guys, which is all you basically have when you start, are just ragtag dudes with guns. They're kind of like your survivors from Zombicide. They shouldn't be particularly well trained. And then in the, ne at the next few characters you buy, the rangers and the paratroopers, and getting up into the Ajax. And the Ajax is this giant battle suit that shoots missiles and fires guns, you know, this kind of mech armor. 
You get an Ajax and it wipes out three aliens. It's the difference between the movie Alien and Aliens, mm -hmm. right? Alien is this kind of horrific moment of like, oh, this is so scary and these people have stand no chance. And then in Aliens, there's parts where you're rooting for the Marines because they're just blasting people away and you're having this you know, awesome time, this action movie time. And when you buy that one big unit, that turn feels like that action movie where you're like, how far is this one guy gonna carry my lane against these four brutal aliens that I've got? And so there's times where you're, everyone's cheering because you bought that one guy, he comes down, the first card you flip over, he destroys it. The next card you flip over, he destroys it. And the third card, it just destroys him and everyone's just like, oh my God, like he made it so far, right? So it, again, it's one of those things where the tone of the game does change based on how you're investing, but it has a nice ramp of like really interesting and simple at first, but I'm using these kind of weak guys. Then I'm using these kind of mediocre guys and that's when the game's real tense, but I've saved up and I've bought this one awesome dude uh -huh. who's gonna tear tear up the aliens for a turn and it's really exciting, right? So how does the game change from game to game? Is there some sort of random, randomized mechanic sure. with each game? Yeah, so when you uh, actually pick your, you sit in front of your lane and what you actually pick is a division of the base. And your division has a special power, so the med bay gets a special bonuses to, uh, to healing people. Uh, the armory gets special bonuses to using uh, grenades and guns. And so basically, you that determines what special ability you as a player are going to have and what kind of cards go out onto the board. Okay. Uh, and again, it's a, as, as with any deck builder, there are, you're building a deck and we have these kind of slots of, oh, you can buy weapons or you can buy the guys who use the weapons or you can buy armor or you can buy uh, you know grenades and stuff. And so it's a little bit of a random element of what gets dealt into those slots as well as what part of the, the base you are, what division you are. And so all of that does a really good job to keep the game fresh, as well as the fact that you have these random aliens and that you're, they're always being dealt face down, except for the first one. So you don't, you never know what's next, even in your first turn, you never know what's next, right? Right, and I guess it sounds like with the way that's built, I guess the game does open itself up for expansions in the future yeah. uh, with uh, additional powers, new monsters. Yeah, so some of the things we've talked about is other aliens. There's a possibility you'll have other aliens. And the, the, the hive was very cleverly designed, that's the current alien race that's in the game, as being a certain kind of direct damage and prolonged damage, like kind of debuff. That's the kind of skills they have. Future aliens might have something that does things like uh, they always directly deal damage to your base, or maybe they'll do something along the lines of like, they don't do particularly bad damage to you. Some aliens don't do bad damage to you immediately, but they have prolonged effects or something, right? right. That's the ideas we're kicking around right now. We put all of our interest and in, in time into making the box that you're gonna get immediately as awesome as possible, but we do have really cool ideas for the future. Even things like um, having other corporations, because you're playing as the Nortec Corporation. Oh, okay. Having other corporations that, hey, now, instead of the, these guys, you play as these other guys that are have different kind of different abilities, or even uh, having something where we flip, you flip the script and maybe one game you get a pack of aliens and you're playing as the aliens and the game is playing as the Nortec guys. Wow. So you, we have ideas that could happen in the future. We're still playing with those. Right now, our, our time and interest has been invested in making the box copy amazing, right? Right. And speaking of which, so this is going to be a Kickstarter. Yeah. Can we expect to see it soon? It should be very soon. Depending on when you get this video out, uh, people should be expecting it within days, maybe? Because wow. we've, uh, I, I know for a fact, though, we've already put out one trailer that says May of this year. Okay. So it's May has got yeah. five, six days left in it. Right. So, yes, it's, it's going to be, be close. soon. Yeah, okay, yeah. Be close. That's fantastic. Well, you start out this segment, it's like, hey, a game that doesn't have miniatures. But when I hear that, it's like, oh, not the cool miniatures. But I also, in my mind, I hear or think lower price point yeah. than maybe something like Arcadia Quest sure. or, or a Chaos Ball base set or something. So I'm assuming that this base game will probably be cheaper just because it's mainly cards. Yeah, so it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be, I think we're thinking around $60 right now. It's going to be a cheaper price point. But one of the things is, uh, one of the things people like about us with our miniatures is that we make these high quality, really attractive miniatures. Right. We take that aspect, that, is, that aesthetically pleasing part of our games, and we put it in Xenoshift. The artwork has got to sell you on the game, right? I can sit here and talk about mechanics on all day, and sure, hardcore gamers are going to love those mechanics, but when I'm walking through Gen Con or CMON Expo, what's going to make someone stop and look is a really cool 
a piece of art and maybe a nice game board, right? And that's right. what we have, which out of the box, we have this nice big game board that has your places for all your cards to go. And then on top of that, we're going to have the awesome art that is in the cards, which the aliens look amazing and the Marines look amazing. When the cool thing about it is one guy did all the aliens, one guy did all the, all the uh, Marines, the Nortec troops, right? He, one guy did all of that uh, for the aliens and one guy did all the Nortecs. So it's two guys. All the art looks consistent and, yes. go, you know, what's cool is that those two guys have worked together before, too. So their style is very complimentary. And when we, we hired them, one guy was like, so who's doing your aliens? And we, we told him and then he was like, oh, yeah, oh, well, I'll, I'll kind of work on my style a little bit to get it because I know what his aliens are going to kind of look like. And then we told the alien guy, he's like, oh, yeah, I know what his, I know what his, his troops are going to look like. So I'll kind of change my style. So there is a tonal difference between the two because, yeah, you want ones to look kind of cool and they're... You want that the kind of bright, action-looking movie from your troops, and you want that kind of dark and scary from the monsters. So there's a little bit of difference, but it looks like they all take them one cons- place in one consistent universe, right? Now, speaking of which, does Xenoshift take place in an existing universe, or is it a brand new universe you built? So we are hoping to tie all of our own IP. So not stuff like Zombicide, because we don't technically own that. We just publish it. But anything that we own, we would like to make everything take place in one universe. And so in this case, uh, the United Worlds is where Nortec exists. And if anyone who plays Dark Age uh, knows the United Worlds is 500 years. Uh, Dark Age takes place after 500 years after the United Worlds have fallen apart. So this is f- like future lore, basically. Uh, or Dark Age is like takes place in the future of the Xenoshift universe, right. I should say. Yeah. Right. OK, fantastic. So the. Uh, Kickstarter is going to be coming soon, and I assume that with um, being a card-based game, that it probably may come to market quicker than some of your other Kickstarter games that had a lot of miniatures, because it costs productions quicker. Sure, yeah, because uh, most card production is a month or uh, two to three months mm-hmm. for large print sums and, and cuts, and then box design. Uh, miniatures take months and months and months and months and months. So it will be a quicker turnaround time, so the delivery date will be sooner than doing something like Arcadia Quest or... Uh, or there's on the side, right? Okay. So we're very happy that people will have this game by the end of the year. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, so Xenoship, that's that's the big announcement this, yeah. this time. Yep. Fantastic. So this is the second CMON Expo. Yep. It's been fabulous. I have had so much fun here. It's become like your ex. It's become the Simon Expo for like the big reveals. Yeah, y'all, yeah. y'all have had the reveal of Xeno Shift and s- several other announcements. Yeah. The Zombie Side Season Three. Yeah. And it's almost becoming like this is the place you want to be for the CMON reveals. Other there's other companies like Privateer Press has their a convention in January, February where they do their announcements and then release it at like Gen Con and Origins. We're kind of getting the same thing here, and it's really great because it's a very intimate con yeah. because you guys are really community focused. It seems. Yeah. So this is a good way for us to pay back to our community because Expo has never been about the money, right? Where even if. Even if it gets huge, we're never going to really let it get more than 500 to 1,000 people, we're thinking. And the reason why is because what we want it to be about is we want it to be about you come in and you sit down and you play a game with Eric Lang. You know, you play Chaos Ball, you play Arcadia Quest, or one of his other upcoming games, which we announced this week, uh, is coming with, he's doing with Guillotine Games, right? Yes. Uh, so any of that stuff that he's doing, you know, you can come and talk to Eric with, or Mr. Black, who does Dark Age and Wrath of Kings, as well as Xeno Shift. Uh, you know, we have these people, or Ted Terranova who did River Wars, these people come, you can come meet them and play their game and ask them all sorts of questions about it. And another cool thing is having these media personalities like Tom Vassell and Rodney Smith come and play games and talk to them not only about how they got started and, and what they did to get where they are, but also just to sit down and play games with people who you watch play games all the time, right? Right. Sitting down and playing a game with Tom Vassell, who you watch play games on the internet all the time is an exciting moment, right? And so. It is a way for us to pay back to our community who, is, who have backed our Kickstarters, who have bought our products, who have helped us get where we are. And we say, hey, look, we're going to invite you. This is a cheap con. Three days, pre-reg is $25. We're literally, the reason why we do the $25 pre-reg and it's not free is because we got to get by on something. You right. know? But I mean, there's other conventions that don't offer as much and charge way more, right? And the reason why is because 
this is just a celebration for us and we want to keep doing these we want to do more of these hopefully in the future one in, here on the east coast maybe one in the west coast maybe midwest because you know and scatter those throughout the year because we want to have people come and meet the people who make our games and have that experience of like i went to cmon expo and i got to meet the guy who made one of my favorite games and just talk to him yep you know and that that's a really important uh part of this company. And you talked about the uh, having the guest in, and I think that's really neat, because at Origins of Gen Con, the, the guests of honor typically come, and they're shuffled around, and they're meeting with the press, and talking with people, and you may get to see them, but you may not get to talk to them. Sure. So your guest of honor, Tom Vessel and Rodney Smith, I mean, they're walking around, they're they're playing with people. I was playing a game with uh, Rodney earlier, and one of his, uh, the guys that uh, watches the show came up and thanked him for it, and actually sat down and, and played a game with us. And then, like you said, you get to meet the designers of the game, which maybe at Gen Con, you may get to shake their hand or something, but those guys are so busy with the press yep. and, and everybody else in the media yeah. uh, trying to get their time that just, you know, the casual game player doesn't get to come and talk to them and shake their hand, thank them for the game, and even take feedback. Yeah. Uh, we were playing I was sitting at the table when uh, the guys, uh, Rodney and Tom and Steve Avery, were playing Arcadia Quest. And what's great about the designers will actually listen to the, the feedback. And for example, little thing, uh, uh, one of the guys had mentioned that on the cards for Arcadia Quest, it was hard to read the value of the health or the value of the, the defense role. It was hard to read the font, the number. One of your production guys came over and said, you know, you're right. I think we can tweak that in our second run and fix that. So you guys take those feedback. You don't get like all defensive or anything. It's like, yeah, we want to make sure our game is the best it could be. We'll do that little tweak for you. I mean, when you have somebody like Tom Vassell or Rodney Smith say, hey, I, I play a lot of games. And this one thing is something I might change. You're gonna to listen to that feedback because they're it's validated, right? Those are even in Tom Vassell's case, he's the guy who's gonna be reviewing the game. Right. In Rodney's game, in Rodney Smith's case, he's the guy who's gonna teach people how to play the game, right? And so in both cases, you wanna make sure you have the best product out there. And so we're not gonna get defensive. You know, even when our fans give us feedback like that, our fans, we listen to them too and say, okay, we're gonna do as much as we can to make sure it's the best product you have in your hands. You know, if, if we change something, we put up PDFs, right? Because we don't want to charge you for changes, right? As long as it's a something we can change with ease, we're going to find the easiest way to get it to you, download PDFs and such like that. Because we believe in trying to make the best product, and if there's something that needs to change, we're going to do it, right? So we're not afraid of changing second print runs like we did with the first Zombicide. There was a rule that people were questioning. We made it clear in the second print run of Zombicide, and we put the PDF up on the internet, right? Right. That's that's fantastic. So here's the thing. I assume there's going to be a CMON 2015. Yep. Um, if you want to come check out, listen to some of the great reveals, talk to the designers, meet some special people, and maybe be like this guy and even get a job if you work super hard. Well, that can't guarantee you that, but that's a really yeah. cool story that yeah. you came here last year and ended up with the job here, which yeah. is pretty slick. Great. So, here, uh, CMON Expo 2015, come to Atlanta, uh -huh. check out some cool stuff, talk to some cool people at Cool Mini or Not. Cool Mini or Not, probably April or May. We'll see. We're moving. We're, dates are moving around it all the time, so we're going to see. We'll have we'll have dates probably post Gen Con. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much for thank your time. You.